In the far reaches of China, the town of Gongsheng is slowly coming to life. Before getting to grips with the day's work, there's a group exercise to loosen up the labor force of China's booming economy. At seven in the morning, and the single communal taxi that serves the border crossing into Burma is being prepared for the grueling journey. Fong is heading to his home village to see his grandmother, one of the few remaining ethnic Lizus. Put them up there. He's bringing with him a special gift, a pedigree pig that will be used for breeding. He's worried the animal might get hurt given the awful conditions along the way. Make it tight, it mustn't fall. Well, get sick like everyone else. You, you know what the road's like. Go carefully, it's precious. If it dies, you'll need to compensate me. In the areas bordering Burma, it's almost impossible to find petrol. Cheng, the driver, always takes an extra jerry can, which he plans to sell in the village for twice the price he paid for it. Ever since China's economy took off 30 years ago, the nation's roads have been considerably improved. The government has built roads across some of the most remote regions. Massive projects to open up isolated villages where in the past they could only be supplied on horseback. It'll take about six and a half hours to cover the 96 kilometers. The road to Fong's village is one of the most dangerous in China. The driver, Cheng, makes the journey once a week. Are the conditions really bad? Terrible. Dangerous as well? Well, a child was killed in an accident just the other day. But don't be scared. I've been driving on this road for six years. A road in the middle of nowhere in the Duong Valley is the only route open between China, Burma and Tibet. We mustn't stay here, there could be more rocks falling. You have to remain focused. One slip and it's all over. You learn as you go. It's just the driver's instinct. All I can tell you is there's space for just one vehicle. The Duong Valley is still a wilderness, thousands of square kilometers of jungle. Its only inhabitants are slowly disappearing. But in recent years, rich deposits of lead and tin have been discovered. It's become a magnet for sometimes unscrupulous fortune hunters, a new breed of Chinese adventurer. This is worth a lot. The communal taxi left the city of Gongsheng just over one hour ago, and the paved road has given way to a dirt track. The first bumps, the first oncoming traffic, and the first bad news. Hello, friend. Be careful, it's awful further up. Why, what's happening? The road's blocked by falling rocks. On the road? Yep. The road is unstable and there are frequent landslides. It's vital that before continuing, they inform their loved ones exactly where they are. 
in case of accidents. The rescue services will know where to find them. This is the last place where the cell phones will work. Hello, sweetheart. The road's blocked at the pass. But don't worry, the locals are going to clear it with explosives. You seem worried. No, actually this happens often, but sometimes you can get stuck for two days. The landslide was way up there, at an altitude of 3,400 meters. As the taxi disappears into the mist, the road narrows as it skirts cliff tops that drop off dramatically. To deal with the conditions, your vehicle has to be in perfect condition. The brakes, the steering, and mainly me. I'm not allowed to be tired. You have to be focused. One slip and it's all over. The rockfall was in this tunnel. So what's the plan? I don't know yet. We'll need to go and take a look where those people are there. The tunnel was excavated in the 1980s, but has never been properly completed. For 30 years, the locals have been risking their lives each time they use it. It's a 400 meter gauntlet of danger, especially during the monsoon when the rain loosens the rock face. Hey driver, go slowly. It's difficult, the wheels keep sliding. This is where the rocks fell. We'll see if there's anything we can do to help. Come on, everybody get out. You see what's going on? All these rocks have crashed from up there. From the roof. Come on, hit it harder. Well, we've cleared this part over here. But there, it's still blocked. This will take a while. Dig more this way, please. Hey, what about the light? Who switched off their engines? Come on, start it up again. So as not to run down their batteries, the engines are left running for the headlights. Ten men have been working flat out since early morning amid the exhaust fumes and dust. And at any moment there could be another rockfall. Fong and one other passenger scout ahead to check the tunnel exit. Uh, there'll be lots of people waiting on the outside, you'll see. Hey, you got a cigarette for me? You've been waiting long? Me? Ma, I just arrived. Do you often take this tunnel? I make this journey three times a week. There are rock falls the whole time. This year, though, it's been worse, what with all the heavy rain we've had. The water seeps into the tunnel, it makes it crumble. 
Most of the passengers know this route well and have been accustomed to such delays. Inside the tunnel, some trucks are trying to force a way through. Go right. Mind your wheel. Go back. Reverse. Mind your rear view mirror. No, never mind. You'll never get through. Look, there's not enough room for your truck. We'll get rid of the beams. The beams, however, act as the tunnel roof's main support. Despite the danger, and to make more space, it's decided to knock a few of them down, risking yet more rock falls. Fong takes charge. We've got no choice. It's the only way to widen the passage. Come on, come on, move forward. Slowly does it, come on. Without the beams and support, some of the drivers are uneasy, fearing the vibrations from the trucks could bring down more rocks. After a two-hour wait, the communal taxi also makes it out. There's another 50 kilometers to go to the village. But the worst part of the journey lies ahead. Further up in the mountains and along the track, The men cry out to avoid or warn of danger ahead. They're woodcutters, and to hurtle down into the ravine, they use rounded sections of wood. The makeshift camp in the middle of the jungle is home to a small group of men who produce charcoal. It's a tough job, especially out in the rain like today which also means the roads become treacherous too. Mao Lin is a veteran, having worked here for eight years. Alongside are Yung Fu and Li, his two nephews. During the school holidays, the two youngsters go out with Mao Lin as part of their training to become woodcutters. You see, you need to be very careful when the tree falls. It could snap in two and fall on top of you, which would not be good. The kids start off on small branches. You like this? No, it's tiring. It's a stupid job. How much do you earn? About 10 euros a week. It's hard, dangerous work, but it pays well. These kids earn the equivalent of 40 euros a week, about a quarter of the average wage in the region. After cutting up the wood, the kids load up the coal ovens. You have to put the wood right at the back, along the stones. Then you light the fire on the other side. This is where you dig out the earth to put the embers. The heat from the embers will take two days to turn the logs into charcoal. Mao Lin heads off down to the village to sell his charcoal alongside the road. At least, that's the plan. During the monsoon, it could rain for eight hours a day. 
If it rains for too long, then it'll be difficult to sell anything today. Two hours later, the rain lets up, and Maolin gets down to business. Put the plastic on properly. Why? Because it's raining, and we need to cover the charcoal, otherwise it's useless. You often go down this way? Uh, two or three times a day on the road. Okay, come on, let's go. It takes two hours to negotiate a steep, narrow and slippery path, with the kids carrying five kilos of charcoal and mail in 15 on their backs and at a fast pace. They need to reach the village quickly to be able to sell their charcoal. But after half an hour, the pace and the weight they are carrying proves too much and too painful. The small family needs to catch its breath. You okay? My feet will get soaked. Sometimes the coal falls out and into our shoes and that hurts our feet. But even worse are the stones that fall on our heads. Come on, we need to get going. The biggest challenge lies down below the village. They need to cross the river to reach the road. Yung Fu is looking for an essential tool to get them across. It's my pulley to get across. That's yours? Yes, we each have our own. The only means to get to the other side rapidly is to use the cable, suspended high overhead. It's 50 meters long and it allows them to cross in 30 minutes, as opposed to the extra half hour it would take if they hiked to the first available bridge. One year ago, an adult died while making the crossing, and ever since, no child is allowed to cross on their own, without villagers checking the equipment first. Ever since the accident, we've had to watch out for the children, even if they use it often. The cable snapped, and the woman disappeared into the rapids below. But now the cable's been replaced. Now what happens if you fall? I'll swim. Wrap your leg tight around the basket. Hang on to me. Oh, oh the basket's turning. Yung Fu didn't push off strongly enough and is now suspended in mid-air halfway over. It's what they fear most, getting stuck halfway with a heavy load and having to use just their arms. Help me. Good. All right, take the basket. Meolin sells his charcoal on the roadside for one yen a kilo, about one cent. It doesn't seem much for the risks they've taken, but it sells quickly, and he will make several return trips to sell more. Meolin has chosen a strategic point along the most frequented route in the region, 
the only one available for the new fortune hunters. Ding Wei is one of the so-called mineral prospectors. Accompanied by his workers, he crisscrosses the region, hoping to make his fortune. I'm looking for tin or lead. In these wild areas, it's not easy. Ding Wei is heading off to see whether his latest acquisition will prove profitable. Six months earlier, he had invested a considerable amount of money in a mine, where he hopes to find lead. Up till now, there's been no trace of the elusive mineral, but if he does find it, he can expect to become a millionaire in just a few months. But the path to riches is not an easy one. Well, what the hell have they done here? Is it serious? Actually, it could be worse, but it's hard to say. The truck seems to be getting in deeper and deeper. They've raised the wheel to put some stones underneath. Uh, it's the only way to get it out. Heavily laden with humans and supplies, the truck has been slowly sinking in the mud since early in the morning. The passengers try, by whatever means, to get the wheels unstuck. So how's it going over here? Hurry up! What with the rain, it'll keep sinking. Ding Wei is losing patience. We need to get going. And decides to take matters in hand. You take care of the wheel and stop digging here, it's pointless. And fetch some more stones. Ding Wei may be giving the orders, but he has no intention of getting dirty or fetching stones himself. Come on, it's about to rain. We must get going now. Well, let's hope this works. Come on, we'll all push. Knee deep in mud and breathing in the exhaust fumes, the passengers encourage each other. Quick, 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 get on the truck. Dingwe knows all too well the hazards of this kind of road, having traveled them for many years. At 15, I used to be a truck driver. What did you do exactly? I used to go looking for wood and granite on the mountain near where I lived. And driving a truck is a lot trickier than a four-wheel drive. You ever get into trouble? Yes, I remember once I had an accident because the steering wheel had not been properly repaired. It got stuck and my truck tipped over. Luckily, I wasn't hurt and I managed to scramble out of the passenger door. But being a truck driver is over now. <laughs> Damn, now what? I think we'll be stuck here. The downpour of recent days has caused part of a hill to slide onto the road and his workers have been trying to clear the mess for two days. What's happening? Ah, it's come down from up there. No, don't stay here. The rocks are still coming down. Are the risks really worth it? You know, there's a lot of money to be made in a mine. 
Uh, but it's a bit like roulette. You can quickly make a fortune, or you can lose it all. That's it. I've had enough of waiting. I'm going through. Get out of the way. You think it's okay now? Well, all I can tell you is that there's room for only one car on this road. But a few kilometers further on, fate decides otherwise. You can get off, please. Uh, still another problem ahead. This time it's the road itself that has been swept away. Well, there must be a way through. They'll guide me through. Hey, you need to dig up the mountainside a bit more, that side. That way it would be further from the ravine, it would be safer. Come on, all aboard everyone. There's still another 20 kilometers or so to the lead mine, a short distance to have suffered the trials of hell for so long. Dingwei makes it, it'll mean riches or ruin. On the far side of the valley, the communal taxi is getting a rough ride. As are the passengers. The driver has to concentrate all his attention to keep control of the vehicle and to avoid losing what is stacked up on the roof. What was that? Something fell off. Let me have a look. Oh, it was the pig. <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, we need to put it inside the car. Ah, no way. No pigs inside my taxi. Give it to me, gently. Wait. Hey, look at your animal. It's bleeding. The pig did indeed injure itself when it fell. It's all the bumps. He's a bit worse for wear. So will he be all right? Yeah, yeah. Don't worry, let's not waste more time. Okay, here we go. There is a steady stream of trucks along this road carrying wood and bringing hope to the valley. For the past few years, the government has been trying to repopulate areas more or less abandoned by the local peasants. Most left to work on building sites or in the factories that supply the world. But the economic crisis has made work harder to find, and many peasants have been returning to their villages. In an attempt to get the locals to stay put in this region, the government has been offering free housing for the poorest inhabitants. It's like under communism. Those who need them are given houses. Where have you come from on this trip? From Gongshang and I left the day before yesterday, but I was stuck because of a rock fall in the tunnel. The houses built for the poor are just at the entrance to Fong's village. The 
communal taxi has taken 15 hours to cover the 80-kilometer route, a journey that should take just six hours. Happy to have made it? Please, yes, uh, but I'm full of aches and pains. Oh dear, the can's been leaking. It's all over the place. Can's almost empty. Look, here's the hole where the petrol came out. Why is that serious? Well, I can't fill my motorbike now. Cheng, disappointed, decides to give what's left of the petrol away for free. But the 15-hour journey has at least earned him 100 yen per passenger, a total equivalent to 60 euros, which is decent money. How's the pig doing? Oh, he's all right, my pig. Just needs to rest, a bit of treatment, and he'll be fine. The pig is for Fong's grandmother, who owns a small restaurant in the village. Would you like a nice hot potato? Get out, shoo! With her, the past comes to life. The 85-year-old lady has lived here all her life and has some painful memories. During the 1940s, the region was under Tibetan domination. When I was young, the Tibetan lords would raid the region and seize the women to be slaves. We were rounded up by the dozen. Myself and others who were left behind had our faces tattooed, so we could never get married. The old women here are all tattooed. The women the Tibetans took away never returned. The balance of power has changed dramatically. The women of the valley no longer live in fear of the Tibetans, whose closest villages are just a few kilometers away. High on a mountainous plateau, a monastery is home to about 10 monks. Their days are spent in prayer and meditation. Chang, at 22, is the youngest. His mission is to convert the valley people to Buddhism. There's a growing belief in the Buddha in the valley. Since I've been visiting the village, the locals have become much more interested in religion. It's a blessing for the monastery. Ever since Tibet was annexed by China in 1950, Tibetans, and in particular Tibetan monks, have been closely monitored suspected by Chinese authorities of fostering hopes of independence among the population and inciting them to revolt. Go back a bit more. Is that close enough? Yep. As a result of these suspicions, temples have been destroyed and some monks imprisoned. What is taking place here is, for China, almost miraculous. Chang's Chinese converts have come to help rebuild the temple. They could get into trouble if they're seen with a monk, but it's a risk they're willing to take for their religion. In return, they'll get a few prayers and some alcohol. I don't pay them. I give them drink or beer. They're believers, you see, and they do it for Buddhism. They are the faithful, and we've never had any incidents because we pray a lot at the monastery to prevent that from happening. Once the truck has been filled, Chang is keen to place the last stone himself. Oh, it's heavy! <laughs> we'll be off then. You think your old truck can make it back up to the village? Of course. The monk has every right to be concerned. The speedometer may be new, but the truck is ancient. And the engine needs regular adjustments.
The problem is the road goes up and down and the truck doesn't like that. So we need to watch the engine, know when to change gear and drive at the right speed. So it's not easy. You learn this by practice, by instinct. To save his engine as far as possible, the driver has a technique that is particularly risky. Downhill, he freewheels, engine off, foot on the brake. But at the foot of the hill, the climb up the next slope will take time and patience. The truck struggles on the ascent and slows to barely 10 kilometers an hour the engine on the brink of overheating. Uphill, the trick is a small homemade tap under the seat. You see this water tap? I use it to cool the engine from the tank that's on the roof. Without it, it would overheat, break down, and that would be the end. Okay, can I reverse? Yes, yes, go straight back. It's the last load, and now work on the new pagoda can finally begin. <laughs> Chang is hoping the Chinese authorities will allow him to expand his monastery so that it can house up to 30 monks. the slightest sign of unrest in Tibet, the government will shut down most of the temples and expel the monks. On the slopes opposite the temple lies Fong's village. Today is a big day, for it marks the start of the hunting season. To earn some extra money, Fong hunts for flying squirrels, which are considered a delicacy in his home region. The slivers of bamboo will be fashioned into arrows. In these parts, the weapon of choice is the crossbow. In the valley, almost no one owns a firearm. The cartridges are far too expensive. This is how you carry a crossbow, you see. It has to be kept firmly against the body, so it doesn't get caught in any branches, and so that you can also run after the prey. To give their prey no chance of getting away, the hunters coat the arrows in poison. It's a quite natural poison made by crushing the leaves of a certain flower. The flower is picked in the mountains during the spring and then dried. It is highly toxic. Before handling it, the hunters make sure they have no cuts or wounds on their hands. When the poison reaches its target, there's no immediate effect, but 10 minutes later, even if it's been barely touched, the animal will collapse, and there's no way it will survive. All we need to do is pick it up. Preparing for the hunt is a long and meticulous process. While his friends finish making the arrows, Fong goes on ahead, as it's his job to open up a path to their hunting cabin. The machete must be razor sharp for the remainder of the path. It's a three hour long trek through the torrid jungle. Ah, oh, there you are finally. On our way here, we spotted some flying squirrels. 
It was down this way. Are you sure? It's uh, in these trees? Yeah, I saw several flying bats. Let's begin the hunt over there, then. Fong is concerned about the humid conditions, which are no good for his crossbow, as it causes the string to stretch and lose its power, and the wood to expand, meaning the bow will be far less accurate. Well, I won't be as precise as before. That'll still work. The jungle is home to countless numbers of creatures, insects and invertebrates, some of which are dangerous, such as this leech, which, once it has attached itself, can only be removed with salt. For snakes and other creatures that might be harmful, Fong has brought along a marvelous product that is meant to ward them off. It's a repellent. See, and you splash it all over yourself. The product stems from traditional Chinese medicine. Up here, there are venomous snakes. If you get bitten, your whole arm could rot in just a few minutes. Do many people get bitten? Oh, yeah, far too often. Now, ideally, you should spread this all over your skin, but it stings and stinks. It's seven o'clock at night, and the hunt gets underway. To make the evening profitable, the hunters will need to kill at least 30 squirrels a night. Look, they're out. I saw one over there. Well, use your lamps. Let's go. To lure the animals, Fong imitates the sound of a female. But the light from their lamps attracts unwanted attention. Look, a snake! It's huge! Get back, get back! They'll need to tread carefully in the dark. Yeah, you go down there. The light, over here. Quickly, the light. There's one up this tree. Quick, see if you got him. I can't see a thing. You must have missed him. So far, all they've caught is a leech. The hunt gets off to a poor start for Fong and his team, but they have another two weeks before them in which to reach their target of 500 flying squirrels. It's the moment of truth for Ding Wei, the fortune hunter. Oh, it's taken me six hours to get up here, and I'm just below it now. He'll soon know whether he was right to invest in the mine. He's hoping to find lead which in China is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> Are you tired? <laughs> well, obviously. Every time he visits, Ding Wei brings some small presents for his miners to cheer them up. Today, it's some hens. Here, take the hens and the milk. Boring each shaft takes at least six months. The miners rarely head back to town and often work in shifts, day and night, to extract the lead from the 20 or so mines that have been dug into the mountains. About a hundred men and a few women live here in tough conditions, crammed together in makeshift tents. It's a harsh, male-dominated environment in which the ladies try and maintain at least some femininity. Hello, everyone. Hello, boss. We found some deposits. Let me show you on the map. Great. Show me a sample. Oh, 
This is worth a lot. What's in this rock? There's lead in this, see? How can you tell? From the black stains. See, there's plenty. Let's see if the entire seam is rich. Let's not waste time. If there's a rich seam, how much is it worth? A lot. Which means? Well, there's a lot of money to be made. Maybe 100,000 euros. A day. That's why I'm doing all of this. It's this way. The gallery stretches for 400 meters into the bowels of the earth. The gas and humidity irritates the throat. This should be it. I can't see anything. Why is there no power down here? You should have set that up. Well, give me your lamp. Oh, I can't see anything. No, I don't think this is the right place. Hey, Abby, what, you lost your seam or what? Come on, show me the right path. I don't want to hang about here for hours. The mine is a labyrinth with dozens of galleries, and in order to save money, none of them have been shorn up. Security here is not a major concern. Is working in the mine uh, tough? Well, I'm used to being in the dark. Prefer it to sunlight now. But yes, it is dangerous, and people die, often. Just the other day, ten friends of mine were killed when their gallery caved in. You could have put some lights here at least. It's not good work, guys. Boss, it's here. But it doesn't look that great to me. Well, there's lead all right, but it's spread very thinly. And with a financial crisis, it'll just it'll be too expensive to extract it. Hey, take a look, boss. The vein runs down this way, too. Ah, that's more like it. This is the real thing. All of this is lead. This can be extracted. No question. Are you pleased? Sure, but it will depend on how deep the vein runs. In a few months, Dingwei might be a rich man. Something that will attract other prospectors and could disturb the tranquility of the Duong Valley. Turning it, like so many other parts of today's new China, into an El Dorado.